Happy Tuesday, homies, and welcome to the Political Geek Fest. I think it's our ninth week of pouring over the um, Essential Report in this strange and quite surreal environment. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming back to another day of Australia at Home. My name's Peter Lewis. I'm one of the directors at Essential Media and partly responsible with my head geek to my left, John Remington, for putting the Essential Report together each week. Uh, before we get cracking, um, I'm going to pay my respects, as I know everyone will share with the Indigenous owners of this land. I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. I want to pay my respects to Elders, past, present and emerging and recognise the land that we are on was never ceded. For those that are here for the first time, the rules are pretty simple. This is a, a space to share ideas in a respectful and inclusive way. If you are not on um, gallery view in the top right hand corner. Turn that on. Um, and also turn your camera on if you've got the bandwidth and the inclination because then we get to see all the wonderful people that are in the room with us. If you haven't used it before, the chat is where we have our side conversations, introduce yourselves, ask questions. And as we go, we'll bring you guys into the conversation as well. Finally, we record this um, so if you do go on camera, just be wary that you're doing it in a semi-public forum. So I'm um, without Catherine. There was some drama in the Murphy house over the weekend that she may share at a future time. Um, and in her place, I'm really lucky to have two heads rather than just the normal one. Um, I've got my good friend from many um, trips to Barbecue King over the years, Andrew West, who's a long-term <laughs> long reporter, biographer of Bob Carr, and now he does the um, ABC Religion and Ethics Report. And he's a keen um, viewer of politics and a regular person that I like talking, polling to. So Hello. Andrew's going to be with us for the ride. And also Cos Samaras, who's a long-term strategist um, with Victorian Labor and now a sort of a friendly competitor of essentials, but very friendly. Um, Red Brigade, who's been doing lots of public focus groups and he's very generous sharing his insights as well. So he'll be part of the journey as well. But before we get cracking, particularly Westy, this is the first time you've joined us at Australia from yep. Home. What's been your take on the last couple of months of what's happened to this country and how have you been going personally? Uh, well, I've insisted on attending my office at least once a week, only because uh, it's pretty difficult to uh, put together a radio program from start to finish in isolation. And more to the point, um, my neighbours in my block of flats kindly decided to uh, renovate their bathrooms um, during the lockdown, which meant hydraulic drilling and uh, and a whole lot of other noisy office were uh, noisy work which made it impossible to record interviews from home my general view about the uh, the last couple of months is that um, i think it presents a pretty schizophrenic picture of the country quite frankly on the one hand um, we want to uh, uh, you know support people who are really uh, you know disadvantaged um, chronically so by this uh, by the covid crisis but I also fear that it's caused a, um, I'd say, a false, a false comfort with the idea of being at home, being isolated. I totally accept the health measures that are required through the isolation. But I really do worry that a certain cadre of Australians is rather enjoying the lockdown a bit too much without thinking of the long term implications for what it means not to go to work and meet colleagues, uh, let alone not to have uh, sort of ordinary inter human interactions. Cos, you've been um, your life's changed a bit over this period, and you've mm. been one of the one of the um, companies that's um, pioneered Zoom yeah. focus groups a little bit earlier yeah. than us. But tell us how that's been going, and what your overall perception of the you know the great disruptions been. Yeah, from a, from a research perspective, using Zoom is actually quite quite um, beneficial. People are relaxed; they're at home you don't get that sort of group dynamic that you've got to deal with as a researcher when you invite 12 people into a room for an hour and a half and you have, you know, a domineering personality that you've got to overcome. Um, that's a bit more in the background now. And so you get a lot more um, uh, frankness from people, which is good. Um, how the country's going? Well, um, 
I would say that uh, right now we're still in the departure lounge. And what I mean by that is that what that political landscape is going to look like in, in the months and years to come, I don't think anyone knows. And when you're dealing with levels of unemployment, um, where I live, for example, some of the modelling that we've done, uh, unemployment and underemployment, underutilisation combined is around 50% of all residents. Now, I know some of them will, go, will find work, but you're still going to see uh, significant amounts of people who are, are going to be looking for work for a very long time. And I think the economy is still going to... Um, be challenged in a few months time as more businesses realize they can't simply operate or function or make a profit. Um, so we'll have another smaller wave of, of job losses and that's gonna obviously have a political impact. So um, we're, we've been researching right through that entire period from I think stage two lockout, we started doing groups. So we do two groups a night, three days a week. Um, and we'll be doing that now for... So just a Brady Bunch like this, 10 people up on the square. That's it, yeah, 10, 12 people. Wow. And, yeah. So we could do... I, I guess yeah. our, our focus group would be a bit a bit skewed with our 150-odd yes. people right. here, but, you know. That's right. exactly. Um, so that's, I, go on. Yeah, and that's how we do them. So it's pretty, pretty simple. Yeah. Now, we're already getting um, quite a bit of feedback in the chat from Westie's original... Um, a statement of people liking being home. A well, yeah, but they much. didn't listen. Yeah, but they clearly didn't listen properly. I said, I, I think there's a certain cadre of people um, uh, for whom lockdown has been a bit of a relief. You don't have to commute. Um, you know, you uh, you can get up later. I didn't say it. I didn't say it was the broad perception of the country, but I do think there's a certain cadre of comfortable upper middle class professionals <laughs> who'd rather like to this. That's all I've said. Guilty as charged, Westy. But I'm, I'm going to call, uh, there's a few people that have made that comment. We're going to leave that one till the end because the structure of today's um, slideshow, the final thing we do is talk about um, our relationships with others. And I'd like to leave a bit of, a bit of time to dig into that at the end. So what I want to do, though, is start with the top line findings from this week. And I'm going to go to screen share if I can get my act together very clumsily and dive into that. Um, so this is where I just sort of ad lib for a second and push the right buttons and everyone laughs at me because I do this very slowly. And then we should be away and people will nod when we're away. So are we up there? Yep. Yep. Great. So You'll be new to this, Westy. You're not, Cos. Um, if we go from left to right, the performance of the government, very good and quite good, is adding up to 73%. It's the same as last week, a 2% shift from very good to quite good, but that's hardly a do. The government's performance has, and, and the perception of the government's performance over the last couple of months, you can see it's been a steady rise up into the 70s and it's kind of stayed there. Um, and... I'm kind of waiting for that to start trending south, but maybe it won't. Um, and as long as this community cabinet holds together, um, there's enough cover for a government, even when um, something happens like the $60 billion accounting error on the weekend and it doesn't cause, and you know, that was late Friday, so that might not be picked up in these numbers. But you know, my gut is that the, the support for the government will stay as long as the measures stay in place. Um, and at the moment, a lot of the rest of it's just white noise. Um, Cos, are you, are you seeing any sense that the government's support is on the, on the decline? No, no. So um, in, in our work, uh, these numbers are, 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 are replicated in a qualitative sense. Uh, so yes, people are still very supportive of the Prime Minister and the relevant premiers across the country. Um, and I think that will stay in place as long as this country's in crisis. And that could be a health crisis and that can be an economic crisis. And I can, I can talk about that, Peter, if you want in detail as to what that, why that's manifesting in, as it is, where people are going to rally around their political leaders whilst they think there is a significant crisis in the country. Well, as you're talking, I'll just go to the state numbers because yeah. they, they pretty much reflect a similar story. Um, you know, high approvals, a little bit of a drop in New South Wales and, you know, maybe a little bit of air sickness in WA. Yeah, so you can see here, the right across the country, the numbers are fairly solid. Um, 
and they're going to remain like that for some time. Uh, most people at the moment who are experiencing financial hardship or are still concerned about the, the, the epidemic, or the pandemic, sorry, um, are, going to, are, are telling us that they're relying on, on the Prime Minister and the Premiers and the, and the health experts to get them through this. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's from someone who's either got a job or is on JobKeeper or on JobSeek. It doesn't really matter. We're getting the same feedback for now eight weeks. And I think that's going to remain the same for some time. Um, the best way I can, I, uh, the best analogy I can give here is actually, and I hate to use this in, uh, analogy, but it's a wartime analogy. And that is that if you were, if you and I, Peter, were doing research back in World War II, we would come up, we will be seeing similar feedback patterns coming out, out of the electorate if we were yeah. doing the research back then. It's the same sort of mindset we're seeing, which is this: they they're, um, they even look. We 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 we're doing groups again tonight. Uh, I'll be surprised if anyone has gotten worked up about the $60 billion. Overseas. It just feels like we've saved some money. That's a good that's thing. Exactly, and there exactly, might be a yeah. little bit more if we yeah. need it. Westy, what's your, been your view from the cheap seats that, of, of, of the way that our attitudes to the government has shifted over the life of this crisis? Um, I think we need to distinguish between our attitudes to the government as opposed to government. And I suspect that our attitudes to government, as it is represented by public institutions, um, has, is markedly higher uh, than the specific performance of a partisan government. Um, I agree with Cos that I don't expect these numbers to, to change much. I would say that a pandemic or a war, both things which present an existential crisis mm. to a country, will naturally... Um, garner a lot more consensus than, say, you know, the response to a general economic crisis. I don't think that um, uh, you would have seen these same figures for the Labor government's um, rescue package during the uh, global financial crisis. I think it was, uh, I think there was certainly majority support for that. If I mean, uh, golly, we're going back when I used to be at the Herald uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, there was majority support for that, but I, I don't think it was anything like this sort of consensus of three quarters of the population. Um, but I think we need to distinguish generally between people's support for government as represented through essential public uh, enterprises and agencies and the government. I, I, even though the headline figures do not suggest that, I believe people are quite conscious of the difference. Hmm. And um, John Remington, it, it does pick up that the support is sort of cross partisan lines during this period, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, just as, as you mentioned, the high numbers um, illustrate that itself. You do get um, skew um, to, um, with particularly the federal government amongst coalition voters. And this is asked at a five point scale. So that strongly support is more centred amongst coalition voters, where the fairly support or somewhat support is high amongst Labour, Greens and um, other parties. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, can, I, can I just make this other point, Pete? that um, part of the reason I think that the federal government's support is so high is essentially because it's signed on to a social democratic kind of rescue package. Um, I think uh, given that the government was eight weeks ago pretty reluctant to even do a stimulus, let alone a full-blown JobKeeper package, I mean, I sensed a real reluctance to even do a, a Rudd Swan style stimulus. I think if, if that uh, reluctance had persisted, I don't think we'd have anywhere yeah. near this, this level of support. It's really, I think, a level of support for a particular um, uh, public ethos uh, in government. Yeah, I think that's right, Andrew. And we, we've made the point um, in these forums that, um, in a way, Morrison's doing everything against his natural instinct, his Keynesian economics, collaborative decision-making and devolving power down, which is not in you know, the nature of liberal governments in general or this particular leader in particular, but it's worked. You know, I've said in the yeah. past, this is George Costanza when he went against every natural instinct and all of a sudden he got a job with the New York Mets. Um, so he's doing okay. Let, let's just quickly move on. Easing restrictions. Um, there is still a quarter of the population who aren't comfortable with this, but two thirds sort of saying it's time to ease up. This is the great unknown. And I know that cause you've been really active 
on your, and, and if people don't follow Cos on either Facebook or Twitter or his blog, this guy pumps out a lot of insight every day. But you've been one of those that's been saying that um, the talk of, of fast easing of restrictions is just a, a fool's errand. Um, you know, what do these numbers say to you? And again, does it reflect what you've been hearing? Yeah, uh, people's um, the feedback we're getting from 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 voters uh, is largely a uh, a concern that if we ease restrictions too quickly, uh, that uh, we could be facing a second wave. I think the the electorate's biggest fear is having a second lockdown, and whenever we're talking to people, the the overwhelming response is. Look, let's be cautious now. Let's get it right now. Very proud about what we're achieving as a country. Um, very proud about seeing the, the numbers that we're seeing every day and turning on our TVs every night and watching the disaster in, in the UK, in the US and Europe. Um, and, and fully aware of what's going to happen to them when they get hit by that second, second wave because clearly they're not on top of that disease. So they're very, very content in, uh, in, in this country's achievements in that space but very cautious. So, you know, the story today of a school being closed down in, in Sydney, I think it was, um, that's going to get you know, parents a bit more anxious um, and, and, and reinforce that mindset. Hey, let's not rush back into this. I'm, I want to get out of it. I'm happy that they started to loosen these restrictions, but I want to make sure it's done professionally. So it's that sort of mm. um, mechanical response that they're, they're embracing. Yeah. You know, the, it, it is an unknown. So it's mm. almost as if it's going by gut at the moment, Westy. Yeah. So it, it's like we ask these questions, what would you like? And it's a, it's a bit of an emotional response because there is no factual, there, there is no factual roadmap. There is just looking at what's happening in other parts of the world. Mm. Yeah. The, the other thing that I would uh, love um, for you guys to break down for me is this fascinating uh, discrepancy, generational discrepancy. Um, the way I look at it, uh, it's my generation, Gen X, 35 to 54. I'm 51. Um, we, are the, we are the most cautious about, uh, about uh, easing restrictions. Only 43% say, if you add it all up, say that it should be done within the next month. Not surprisingly, um, millennials, 18 to 34, a majority say ease up within the next month. But even more people aged 55 and over say that it's time to ease up within the next month. Uh, within the next month. Mm. What, what do we know accounts for the fact that, um, I don't know, is it because this generation has young children? Is it because- Well, we've got young children and we've got elderly parents. We're mm, kind yeah, of yeah. like, I'm in the same hitting zone as you. Like maybe it's being stuck in the middle and feeling responsible for two generations that yeah. breeds a, a higher degree of caution. We, um, we, yeah. we definitely seen that. Gen Xs, that's the best way you can describe them, uh, are the ones who are the most cautious in, in, in our groups. And it's because they've got kids and they've, got, and they've got parents. And so most people in that age group are worried about their parents. Um, I think all of us in this age group um, have collectively had conversations around how we've, we're making sure our parents stay locked away, and yeah. if particularly early on in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the crisis for us in this country. Um, the other bit I'd like to mention about the, the caution is that the, in, the further you go out in the outer suburbs where people have actually experienced some form of financial or health scarcity, the more nervous they are about um, coming out of a lockdown, irrespective of the financial pressure they are personally feeling. So we're finding that the wealthier you are, the more access you have to information and the more access you have to, um, to what I say, social capital, the more relaxed you are about the situation. Those, those generational differences are really striking, John Remington, also in terms of, I think, for a while, the, the health concerns were concentrated with the older and the Gen X and the economic concerns were Gen X and younger. So you sort of had Gen X at the centre of this Venn diagram where both the economic and the health concerns were sort of hitting them, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, all the people, whilst there were certainly concerned about the virus, as we've gone on, we've seen... The, them seeing, saying they're less likely, or they feel less likely to contract it themselves. So that's particularly low amongst over 55s. Yeah. Um, and Andrew that, yeah, mentioned those age differences. We've also seen some uh, location differences as well. 
So people living in metro areas, and this might be what uh, Cos alluded to, they're a little bit more keen to see restrictions lifted than people living in regional areas. Uh, but there's also be wary of that's um, the age factor in there as well, that people living in cities are likely to be a little bit less young, a little bit long, younger, and also more likely to be employed. One more slide before we come up for air. These are a series of questions around um, the, the, the sunsets for the, the different support packages. So at the moment, there's a six month window on job seeker and job keeper, and I think a, a June deadline on the free childcare. So the dark number is should end as soon as possible. So cut it off now effectively. Um, the dark blue is kind of stick to your deadline and then the extension. So I was a bit surprised. And again, these questions were asked before someone found $60 billion down the back of the couch. So it might change things a little bit, but um, yeah, I don't even know if that tells me too much of the story, except a third of us want to keep spending and a third, you know, more, more than that, think that you shouldn't extend the spending, which, which sort of creates a few challenges in terms of those of us that are trying to argue for, a long-term reset and long-term support here. Mm. Cos? Sorry, that I was just responding yeah. to one of the chat questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so what was the question, Peter? Oh, no, just what do you make of these numbers? Have you got anything there to throw in, Westy, or else we'll come up for air and go to the crowd? Uh, yeah, just very briefly. Um, I noticed there was also a gender difference that men were far more eager to extend the spending, including, for example, on early childhood education and free childcare than women, which I thought was really interesting uh, difference. I also wonder whether it has something to do with a sense of, uh, a greater sense of economic vulnerability that many men feel. I speak of this through a certain deep personal experience. My father, who was a, um, a railway worker and a manufacturing worker uh, was laid off uh, in the early 1990s and never really found um, full-time work again. And I wonder whether there is a certain uh, fear at play, particularly among uh, working class men, um, that their future, their economic future is, is quite fragile. I, I don't know, but it, it, that difference between men and women and the fact that, uh, that men are far more eager for public spending uh, than women struck me as very interesting. Thanks, Andrew. Um, look, we've come up for air. If there are any questions, um, we might sort of have a bit of a chat. I'm just having a... Now, Zoom has changed. So if you get called on to ask a question, um, you're going to have to be you'll be prompted to unmute and you've actually got to manually unmute yourself so that's a bit of a change i know that cos has already responded to crackers keenan in the chat there so we won't we won't call crackers up at the moment we've got a question from jill pierce if jill's available and i am also recognizing if you it is a very male dominated um panel today and i i, I recognize that so please if you're not of the male persuasion sort of speak up and sort of fill out the um diversity in the questions at least Oh, yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hi, Jill. Hi. Yeah, I live in um, rural Tasmania, and um, I was just interested in the rural-urban divide. Um, and it's interesting here in Tasmania, we've been quite impacted in terms of obviously tourism, um, which has, but also in winter, generally tourism drops off. So that sort of, and for locals, it's quite nice because we haven't got so much traffic. We can walk on the streets down here on the Tasman Peninsula. So there's pluses and minuses, I suppose, is what I'm saying. But just interested in if there's any rural urban um, differences in some of those uh, responses. That might be one for our King Gate, John. Yeah, thanks, Peter, and thanks, Jill. Um, yes, yeah, so the differences we do tend to see um, are, um, are there, so the concern that um, of the virus itself does tend to be a little bit lower um, in regional and rural areas than metro areas and whether or not that's just um, that more distance to major population centres and perhaps um, less likely to be around one of the clusters which we've seen springing up. Um, and similarly, where we ask a question about the likelihood of actually catching it them yourself and that is a little bit lower in regional areas again than the uh, big city centres. 
Great, thanks. Um, Eva Cox was in the chat um, making a few comments on those some of those gender disparities and some of the questions. Are you there, Eva? And welcome to Australia. Oh, yeah. well, now you've unmuted. No, other way, you've got to unmute yourself. Go back and click yeah. the button. Right. You are muted by host, it says. No, well, we wouldn't dare do that. Go on. <laughs> you are unmuted by host, it now says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I mean, as a, as, a, as a veteran group person that's listened a lot to groups and various other things, I mean, I did an awful lot of that, haven't done it recently, but I just listen to people in conversations and get my bits out of that too. I think it's a sort of problem at the moment because we've got that the debate does tend to sort of get confined to the economic issues and the economic this and the economic that. And one of the things that is concerning me is there's very little discussion of the social and certainly very little discussion of the possibilities. I mean, yes, people are worrying a little bit about the people that won't have jobs, but this is absolute focus on jobs, on paid jobs and not looking at possibly de doing more about trying to, I mean, I must confess I'm a universal uh, basic income advocate, but something to look at how we actually fill up the gaps that we're likely to have in employment, because it's quite likely there won't be enough jobs. It's all very well training for people. For them. I mean, I made a crack at the end about the, the thing, because trying to think about the women's stuff. I and mean, I can well imagine a large number of women do want it to sort of ease out because they get the kids off to school, they get the children into childcare, they can get out of the house. Mm. And I mean, it's quite interesting that men staying at home don't take up, uh, shall we say, 50% of the housework. And I think we need to take that into account because for women, it's, you know, it does that. But I suppose in general, I'd like comment on things about there's so much discussion of the economics and very little of the social, and that's mm. really a factor in the trust thing. And I think, as I said earlier, I think the fact that there is no real leadership from the more progressive side of politics, apart from dealing with working people, and somebody really ought to point out to the ALP, there's an awful lot of people that don't define themselves as working couples or working people in that particular sense. And there are a lot of people that don't have jobs and they actually have votes. So maybe one should start talking to them as well, because I think there is a need to sort of bolster the communal the social and the things there to bolster onto that sort of feeling that people are having at the moment about feeling unified, feeling good, feeling the desire to help others, but being pushed always back into the individual take care of yourself type model that we've got underpinning neoliberalism because they really haven't undermined that at all. Cos, is it useful to have that? Like, I'm just wondering, the, the, the economic, social as two different things, they kind of end up Mm. Is it a false dichotomy? Is it, and, and if so, is it the role of politicians to bring the two into the one narrative? I think it's an important conversation to have um, because let's, Thanks, let's, let's, let's talk about um, the impact that, that this pandemic has had on young people. So it's not necessarily a health impact, but it's definitely economic. So our analysis um, that we've just recently performed in terms of the impact it's had on the, um, the young people between the ages of 18 to 30 in, in Mel Melbourne um, has illustrated that point. So most young people that live in the CBD of Melbourne or close to the CBD of Melbourne live there for community reasons. They like the lifestyle. It's, it's, it's what they define as a community. And um, the bad news in that is that 10% of them have basically been forced out. So they've lost their jobs and they've actually had to break their leases and go back with mum and dad. And so we're talking about thousands of young people in that, in that category have actually been uprooted and forced out of their community, which there is a social consequence to that. It isn't just economic, is it? So. Westy. Um, the, the question specifically about the, the, the social. Oh yeah. Well, social well, be economic. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, Eva's spot on here. I have really reacted, though, against um, a lot of the uh, language that I've heard. You know, to be honest with you, for example, from um, uh, Daniel Andrews in Victoria, I know he has enormous support, but the way that uh, the debate has been posited as health versus money, um, when in fact, you know, it really, in some respects, the debate over the lockdown has been about lives versus lives. Um, I mean, I have no uh, basis on which to, to say that the lockdowns were wrong, but I, I think it's been an unfortunate juxtaposition uh, that we've suggested that um, uh, anyone who uh, 
has reservations about the lockdown is simply, you know, has murderous intent and wants to go out and party. Um, you know, last week I interviewed, for example, a former assistant general, secretary general of the United Nations, who argued that in uh, much of the world, uh, particularly in his native India, for example, the lockdowns um, are having disastrous social and health consequences. And he presented some really stark figures. I think up until the 12th of May, a uh, six week period up until the 12th of May, uh, I think about two and a half thousand people had died of COVID in India. 58,000 people had died of uh, diarrhea. So really, um, I, I think there's been a bit of a, a false uh, binary here. That's, Westy, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. That's more to do with the different ways we live as communities. So in, in India, in a lot of these developing uh, um, countries, even in places like Queens, Bronx, Kings, and New York, yep. um, in, in the poorer sections of London, the, you ha you've got a, a greater number of people who live in multi-generational families. So you have grandma, uh, middle-aged kids, and, and teenagers living under the one roof. And so when the lockdowns occur, they exacerbate the infectious rate within family structures. Um, so that's, um, yeah, it's a problem in some countries. And we could see that in Northern Italy. We could see that in, in the ethnic um, sections of London. Um, and obviously New York is a good example of what happens when you, um, it's not necessarily about density in bricks and mortar, it's about density of human beings under one roof. Mm. I'm, di I'm diving back in because we're kind of at half time. Um, and we're talking internationally. The other questions we asked this week were really about the Chinese and Australia and um, USA and Australia relationships and some um, benchmarks we've asked over the years. And what's really interesting is the way these numbers have declined in both people thinking that um, the influence of both the US and China um, are positive for Australia. But the one that really stands out here is the Australia international trade, a 31% drop in Australians who, who view that as um, being a positive. Now, this is in the middle of last week's trade war. Um, or whatever we want to call it, the, the, the Bali incident. But there's a lot going on, and I think it's hard to get a, a fluent sense of it just to see that downward trend. So you, you take the right-hand column of the US as being a reaction to Trumpism, and then the China one being, I think, a little bit more dynamic and, and more drastic in, to some extent. I've got a few other slides I want to go through before I get people to comment on this in, in too much detail, because I think they do tell a bit of a story. Um, so the, the next one is um, given a choice, and I know it's a false dichotomy and um, all the policymakers would say you shouldn't have to choose, but the assumption that, um, you know, Australia has turned away from America is just not there. It is still the, seen as the, the superpower of which we, we, we see it um, as having the most beneficial effect. And then in terms of specifically about the, the Bali experts, um, 65% with this sort of stand up, which has been a dominant in, um, narrative going through the media. Um, and 57% um, seeing that the restrictions on the barley is disingenuous. Um, and a couple of other numbers there to give a bit of texture as well. Um, although 53% saying Australia should avoid a trade war. So we're kind of stuck in this sort of competing story in terms of our relationship with China at the moment. And I just, I guess, the question for discussion, um, both with you two guys and then more broader with the group, is whether this whole, like, we, we, we've previously had people on talking about disinformation and the and the perpetuation of stories about, you know, the, 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 the role of China in terms of purposely letting the virus loose, which has its own sort of um, ecosystem. You've got in the States, you can see Trump trying to turn the election into a referendum on China rather than a referendum on Trump. And then you've got astray with this sense that we are being caught in the middle. But um, it seems like the one thing I take out of these numbers is that the, the conditions are ripe for anti-China sentiment within Australia just as much as it is in the States at the moment. So I don't know what you guys want to say about that and whether that's a good point to go back into a broader discussion. I would say that 
there's a qualifier to that. So when we're talking to people, they acknowledge reservations about how China's managed this crisis. Um, they want an independent investigation, but one about identifying why this has happened, not necessarily about blaming anyone. Mm. They are just as critical about the US manage, uh, management of the whole crisis. I mean, it's hard to not, not to be, even for the most disengaged person in this country. Um, but uh, but un, under, uh, sitting underneath all that is a cohort of voters who are acutely aware of just how reliant their employment or someone in their family's employment is, is on China trade. So, you know, you can drive into regional Australia and talk to anyone in regional Australia about um, the, the dependence of those communities on, on agriculture and trade with China, for example. Very acutely aware of it. So I think the, if there's, a, if there's a, any, any particular politician in this country that wants to actually make uh, or take advantage of the anti-China sentiment, there's only a certain point where they can take this, in my opinion before they start to actually get resistance and that's going to be economic. So that economic fragility that's in within the electorate right now is going to hold back that, that what I would define anti-China racism to a point. What do you make of the China, um, the perception of China and how that's going to shape the way Australia understands what's happened over the last few months, Andrew? What I found especially interesting and you alluded to it there, was a dip in support for both the uh, closeness to China, but also a bit to the United States. Um, now, partly that's to do with the adolescent behavior of Trump and no one wants to uh, align or be seen to, to be aligned with that sort of behavior. But there's also been, and someone I think rather perceptively raised the question here about uh, nationalism. But I would, I would agree with that, except in this sense, I think there's been a lot more talk about economic self-sufficiency. And that manifests itself as a form of economic nationalism, which of all the nationalisms, I think is the most benign and arguably can be, uh, can be presented as sort of national investment. I think there's, there's, there's been a lot more talk about the fact that we have uh, supply lines that are uh, you know, strongly yoked to China. And you know, this is not a democratic country. It's a country that's been seen to have uh, obfuscated over the, uh, the source of the COVID. And therefore we uh, need to, uh, you know, we need to develop more economic self-sufficiency. And that has then I think broadened into a greater sense of, um, of, of, yes, we still accept our traditional alliance with the United States, but we're more reluctant or we're more um, uh, reserved about it because of Trump, uh, but we're particularly uh, aware that, um, that China has behaved uh, not as a good international citizen. Just one question on the, the China. What, what, what's been your view of the role of News Limited in percolating this as well, particularly in that so-called leak of a, the, the dossier, which appears to have been a set of press clippings? Uh, uh, <laughs> my view about the role of News Limited in this. Oh, well, look, you know, it's... it's um, uh, if you look at the Oz, which is the only uh, News Limited paper I read pretty regularly, uh, it's always been a China... No, it, it's long been a China sceptic, um, particularly on, uh, you know, defence matters. But to be honest with you, Peter, I, I actually think uh, a majority of the population is now... Uh, is now sceptical of, of China as a good international citizen. I, I honestly don't um, think that... Um, News Corporation's coverage, uh, particularly in that uh, one or two front pages that flowed from that uh, so-called dodgy dossier has, has had much effect. I, I do think China has painted itself into a corner as not a good international citizen by being secretive and seeming to be resistant to the idea of uh, some sort of um, investigation into the source of COVID. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, but as I say, again, um, the, the adolescent behaviour of Trump has made us a bit more, according to your figures, has made us, you know, more reluctant about the US as well. Were it another president, including another Republican president, I think, who, who behaved more rationally, I think, um, you know, we'd be much stronger in our uh, support for the, you know, US involvement. Because focus groups are notoriously 
pretty freewheeling places where mm. people talk about race in quite an uninhibited way. Um, mm. How's it been playing out in your groups? Uh, I, I would say that they, that um, most people's response to the anti-China sentiment is more about, as Westy just pointed out, the handling of the of the pandemic, the secrecy around it. They're not big fans of the racism component. And um, it's, a, it's a point I'm going to maintain right through this entire public uh, uh, discussion going into the many weeks and months to come. And that is that most Australians don't really buy into that. They, they are just as critical about China as they are of the US. And I think, as everyone has said, it's a, more about, in the US's case, about Trump than anything else. Um, but they, uh, I think we're only dealing with a fraction of our society that actually are genuinely racist towards Chinese people. Mm. And, 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 and they are the ones who are making most of the noise and they're the ones you could see on TV and on, on, and on Twitter and on, on, and on Facebook and so on. The vast yeah, majority of Australians speak? are quite tolerant. Yeah. Sorry, can I... I mean, there's one good bit of data here, Pete, that, um, that also reflects what Cos says. Even though... Uh, and this is the net negative uh, about Australia's relationship with China on the question of culture, which you could broadly put under the, so it's not about economics. 44% of people have a negative view of China's influence on Australia's culture. That's a very large minority, but it is starkly different to the people who say that the negative influence uh, from China is mainly due to politics, 59%, and, uh, and Chinese corporations and businesses operating in Australia over 60%. There's a big difference there. And I thought, and I, so 44% of people who have a negative view of Chinese culture is still a troublingly large minority, but it remains a distinct minority compared with those people whose concerns are primarily about China's uh, influence on our politics and on our, uh, and you know, foreign owned corporations. But the, the concern about foreign owned corporations in Australia long predates this. Yeah. On that note, I might bring Peter Clark in, who had a really interesting comment um, about racism and also give him a chance to, to plug his new podcast, if you want to, Peter. You've got to unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'm unmuted now. Have I done it? Very good. Beautiful. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I wrote a quick thing about the arts um, and COVID. We just finished our podcast called Transit Zone on this very topic with a well-known writer and uh, arts critic, Alison Crogan. And she makes the really important point that the arts sector or arts industry, if you want to call it that, is, uh, is interlocked with a lot of other economic sectors in Australia, including tourism and including hospitality. So... Uh, somehow something gobsmackingly wrong is happening to our arts industry generally. I was actually getting you on the Chinese racism. Oh, all right. About the Chinese racism. Oh, okay. All feel right. free to segue yeah, yeah. if you can. <laughs> all right. I've got the wrong cue on that then. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's do a quick segue to that too, because I, and I, I noticed some of the other comments about Chinese racism and there's no doubt there is racism around, but I think we have to make a very clear distinction, don't we, between um, the, the uh, Chinese communist party regime who have been, belligerent, uh, expansionist, imperialist, that's what's going on there. We have to be clear-sighted about that, don't we? Here we are in a bit of a pincer movement between the USA led by him, the Trump, and um, Xi Jinping, who's um, uh, sort of a, a CCP dictator in his own right as well. So yes, it's a very difficult path to navigate, isn't it, between uh, feelings about the Chinese people, I abhor racism, and people who express that and just generalize, that is clearly wrong. But to be clear sighted, um, with all these um, attacks we're getting in the trade area, um, I think we have to be incredibly clear sighted and careful at the same time. I guess that's my general point. Thanks. Guys, do you want to respond before we go into the last slide, which will round us off from where we started? No, I think Peter put it well. Okay, let me see if I can make this work for one. So, this is our last slide today, and it was a question that um, I was really interested in seeing where people were, which is over the course of this lockdown, um, with different relationships, have we felt we've become closer or more distanced through, you know, I think in our very first Australia at Home, which um, Tim Costello was our guest, he talked about the difference between physical distancing and social distancing and really um, called on people to remain socially distant. And I guess 
the experience has also been, um, I think, through this process, I feel that we've got a lot closer to a lot of um, people with shared views. So what's interesting, I think, about here is the dark blue is pe relationships you feel closer, no change, which is the majority in all of them, interestingly, and then feel more distance. But there's almost an inverse between the personal and the external. And I guess it's a little bit, it, it shows a narrowing of our world. I was surprised that there weren't more saying they felt more distance to their partner, but th 36 <laughs> feel that their relationships got closer, which is a fantastic thing. And the same with kids, despite being at home. But with friends and workmates, we feel we've got further away despite the sort of technologies that we may be using. I, I actually feel with our workplace, we've used this technology and everyone feels a bit closer, particularly our Sydney and Melbourne offices, John, but you know, that's because we do beers over Zoom on a Friday and things. But um, Andrew, like, you know, your, your day job is to talk about religion and ethics and I guess more and matters politics, of the politics actually. Yeah, yeah but, but also matters of the soul. And oh, what well, do you think, that, that, well, what do you think this, this, this period, this, this, this great disruption has done to our relationships across those different categories? I think the, the knowledge that this is short term, that is that it can be measured in weeks, if not a couple of months, has reassured people uh, that their relationships may not change fundamentally. If, however, we enter a period where as the World Health Organization says, we may not find um, a vaccine to this. So what does the next two or three years hold? Is it a rolling uh, future of lockdowns, of back to quarantine? I think people will be much more despairing. I suspect that it is the uh, sure and certain knowledge that this is a short term, a temporary thing that has kept people's sort of equilibrium. Um, I really worry about... Uh, you know, this just goes back to the first comment that I made that some people thought provocative. Um, I, I really worry that uh, some people um, find the the working from home, the home-based experience uh, a little too comfortable. Now, as I say, I realise it's because, you know, there's less commuting, uh, you know, you don't have to dress for work, uh, you know, you have more time for household chores, you can... Um, uh, up to a point, spend and enjoy more time with your kids. But at the same time, where do we build, especially by the way, for progressive people, um, where do we build relationships? And it is invariably uh, through person to person contact. You know, it is, no, it is no coincidence that the weakening of trade unionism in this country, one of the last civilizing influences in a market economy, the weakening of, of, of trade union, unionism has come through the disappearance of the mass workplace. Um, so frankly, I, I, I'm, I'd be concerned if, if people thought that um, working from home, social distancing, social isolation, uh, or if not isolation, then uh, frankly, a bit too much of a private life um, was, the, was something good to come out of this. I, I, I really do worry about the end, frankly, of the big workplace because the big workplace was something that could be organized. It was something that could be politicized, frankly. Um, and, uh, and I'm kind of worried about that. Mm. I, I, I think I, I, I particularly think about this platform zoom and whether it can become a replica of that. And I, I think it is fundamentally different, for instance, to Facebook, which streams content at you, you've got to turn up and be in the room. Um, around these events and, and, and if there is an organising strategy, or if, if we are going to be distant, how do we organise so that we have effectively, not just for workplaces, but in, you know, virtual town halls, virtual community centres, so we're not just consuming culture and consuming politics, but we're participating in politics and participating in culture. We're, we're launching our first virtual town hall tomorrow night for um, a federal MP um, who was almost a federal prime minister, Bill Shorten and his electorate. And it's gonna be interesting to see whether some of the, the barriers to public engagement in politics, which has just been inability to get out at night will, will can be broken through this technology. Um, we're also running a town hall tonight for parents with young kids around child um, childcare issues for the parenthood. So. I think you can use this technology, but I think my one reflection has been you kind of need personal relationships to start with and then you can keep the connections going. I think 
if you were just coming into a workplace that was connected virtually, it would be very challenging to build the ties that then become sustaining over time when you use a platform like this. But interested in Cos's thoughts on, on Andrew's reflections as well? Yeah, I'll come from a slightly different angle, but uh, and that is that I mean, I've been doing some voluntary work in, in helping domestic violence, violence groups get some funding because uh, they've had a massive increase in, in workload since the lockdown. So I'm seeing the different side to this, which is not the one I'm personally experiencing, thankfully, as in we've got a nice loving environment here and that's everything is fine. Uh, but uh, out there in, 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 in uh, suburbia, there is obviously a, a, a dramatic increase in violence at home as a result of the lockdown, the job losses and so on. So, and, and then uh, overlaid on top of that is a, there's a, a, I wouldn't say significant group out there, but a, a sizable group who are not um, connected as all of us are here. So they don't have access to the tools that we regularly use online and so on. So that's because they don't have a laptop at home, because they don't have an iPad at home. Uh, they're, they're lacking the hardware to connect. And that's a significant challenge in future if this, our society has to confront a, a similar lockdown in, 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 in the future, that governments probably need to get their heads around to provide these assets to people to actually comfortably live in their own homes and communicate with the, with the outside world. And when they're deprived of those tools, it becomes very, very difficult. I wouldn't mind calling Claire Pullen, who made an interesting point about union organising, if you're there, Claire. No, I will start. So, so Claire basically made the point, and interrupt me if you do, come on. But Claire's point was just that unions have been organising on this platform over this period. There you are. I think I heard someone come up. Hi, Freddie. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Yeah, no, we've been lucky enough, um, working with you, actually, in some cases, to shift our meetings to using Zoom. Um, but there are a bunch of unions, including the ones I'm lucky enough to have worked for, that have been recruiting over text and Facebook and using broadcast digital platforms for a while. So it's not all doom and gloom in terms of union growth. And to be frank, working at home suits a lot of our members, including the women who are on low wages working in service New South Wales, for example. So we sort of taken the approach that we need to go to them rather than wishing for a different workplace. We need to work with what we've got, which is one of the reasons they're growing. Mm. Um, there was also a, a comment, I think, and now I'm going back to my phone. Sorry, guys. Um, from Robin, are you there? Hi, Hi, Robin. Hi. Am I off mute? Yes. Good. Great. Um, okay. Well, yeah, look, I, um, I live in a retirement village, um, a pretty beautiful environment. And I'm surrounded, I have to say this, by mostly women. I'm 75. Uh, and I find it really hard. I've got a few friends in this village, you know, less than the fingers of one hand with whom I can really have a discussion of this nature with some of this stuff. Um, I feel quite lonely at times from an intellectual point of view, although I'm also a bit of an isolate and so, you know, it's okay. I can live with that. I love this. I really enjoyed this. And uh, I'm going to keep it going after this um, situation has changed because it helps my intellectual situation mm. enormously. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, we have been um, grappling with what we do with Australia for Home as the, the lockdown lifts. And the good news is we're booked out till the end of June just from organisations that want to make use of this platform and, and have discussions every day. And then after that, um, I think it's going to be a case of how do we use Zoom in a way that keeps some of these connections going. I was sort of positing today that, you know, it is a, it is a different medium to just watching or scrolling down politics because there is a bit of a, a real engagement with people. And I can see a future where at the end of the day, people just don't go home and look at their phone or look at TV, but they might go into a town hall on a different issue and, and civically engage. None of, none of which is to tear Westie's thesis down, I don't think. And I want to go back to Westie and Cos to round this off because I do think that, that those physical connections, particularly around politics, are really important as well. And I guess 
in a in a world without a pandemic, we would never have got to this place. We would have just kept trying to do what we know has worked in the past. So it's just the disruptions allowed us to come at things from different angles and whether this will end up being part of the mix of what politics looks like or if it's just something that we've done as an emergency measure while a very strange event happened. But, you know, Westy, you've heard a bit of the feedback. What's your parting thoughts to our lovely crowd at Australia at Home? Uh, well... If these sorts of gatherings are, are uh, you know, if, if it is by choice, as this is, these are fantastic gatherings. I simply say that when there is, uh, no, when there is no opportunity for true interpersonal connection, when this is the only option you've got, I, I think that's pretty sort of, you know, I think that's a pretty dark future um, for the ability to organise uh, I'm sorry, but I, I just remain unmoved by the idea that if this is our... I mean, these are great ways to supplement um, activism. These are great ways to supplement uh, community, but I don't think they replace uh, interpersonal relationships. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if that is considered either old-fashioned or radical, uh, but I plead guilty. <laughs> and as Robin has just pointed out, you can't hug your laptop. And if you're thinking of it, please don't. Um, Cos, any final thoughts on, on what this whole era is doing to our ability to connect and I guess our, the different modes of connection? I think that um, it, it's, a, it's a work in progress because I think that we're, 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 we're at the, the end of the beginning. I think the journey that we're all experiencing as a society is, is just started. Um, we're, we, live, we live in a country that's clearly on top of it and is built infrastructure to deal with breakouts. So we've, we're not going to see the same, hopefully, fingers crossed, not going to see the same severe lockdowns that we experienced eight weeks ago. Um, but we're going to see significant problems around the world for quite some time until there's a vaccine and, and there's medical debate in that space. So I think that... This forum and the way we are communicating is going to evolve as well um, over the next six months. I think we're going to get a lot better at it um, and work out ways, going back to Westy's point, to actually find ways to actually improve our human contact without obviously breaking social distancing uh, requirements, which we have to find a way to do it. Yeah, that's great. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, My before pleasure. We, before we finish up, um, tomorrow, it shows how far we've come. We've got... Um, two former premiers from across the political divide, Mike Baird and Jay Weatherall coming together for a discussion led by Anne Davies, who's um, one of the Guardian Australian journalists, um, about what we can learn from the national cabinet process and the future of federation. I think that's a fantastic discussion that'd be great to have you all part of. Um, so that's tomorrow, Thursday, we're having a chat about aged care and the future of aged care and the models of aged care. Um, Friday, you're all invited if, if you're up for it for a three hour um, conference that per capita is putting on on full employment. So, you know, if you want your Zooms, there's so much there. And that, 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 that um, conference on Friday, you can register through Australia at home and be there for the whole day. Wayne Swan, Michelle O'Neill from the ACTU, John Fowlson should be a, a great group of speakers. And also they're using breakout rooms. So if there's an area of policy you're particularly interested with, you're welcome to go and be part of that. And our, our good friend Emma Dawson from Per Capita is putting, putting that whole event together on Friday. But until tomorrow, when we, we, we see the premiers, thanks for being part of it. Thanks to our sponsors, Guardian Australia, Centre for Australian Progress, Principal Co and my company, Essential Media. Um, and yeah, as we tick over to two o'clock, thanks for being with me again and helping me get through the disruption. And thanks, Westy and Cos, for being part thanks, of it mate. today. Cheers, Cheers happy, guys. Happy to. Pleasure. Pleasure. See you, guys. See you.